E equals mc squared. Everyone's heard of it, but what does it mean? How does a relationship between mass and energy arise from special relativity, a theory which seems to be more about the nature of space and time? Einstein derived this formula using relative observers and the Doppler effect, which you can see in this video from Minute Physics. But today, we're going to see how this equation pops out when we take time dilation and length contraction and see how they affect conservation laws. You know, the conservation of energy, the conservation of momentum, some of the most fundamental parts of the universe. Now, just to backtrack for a bit, we're going to assume that you know and accept time dilation and length contraction, which were explained in this video, which assumed that you knew and accepted the idea of every observer in every inertial frame of reference seeing light travel at speed c in a vacuum, which was motivated by the Michelson-Morley experiment in this vid- You know what? Here's a playlist of all the relativity videos to date. <sighs> this is getting complicated. So, back to E equals mc squared. Why is it a thing? Believe it or not, a relationship between mass and energy was well known before special relativity. In fact, there were several derivations of what look extremely similar to Einstein's equation. But these equations were derived in the realm of electromagnetism, investigating apparent mass due to the presence of electromagnetic energy. These effects can be seen when charged particles resist acceleration, which could be interpreted as inertial mass. This can also be seen when light itself is able to exert a force on matter, since light has momentum, which could again be interpreted as some sort of apparent mass. And perhaps in hindsight, the fact that a form of E equals mc squared first appeared in classical electromagnetism may not be so surprising, since this branch of physics shares an interesting connection with relativity, as metaphysics and veritasium show here. Huh. Metaphysics again. Now, let's get back to understanding this equation in the context that we've learned about space and time. But first, let's talk about mass. You may think of mass as being like weight. You can measure an object's mass by putting it on a scale. The only problem is the theory of special relativity doesn't consider gravity, so what do we mean when we refer to mass here? We mean inertia, an object's tendency to resist a change in motion. The heavier something is, the harder it is to get it moving, and the harder it is to make it stop. Let's test out the inertial masses of your pet rocks. Yes, you and your friend have pet rocks now. You can each test your own rocks by hitting them with a 1 kilogram weight and measuring the change in the rock's velocity. You happen to find that your rocks each have a mass of m0. Since this is what your rock's mass is perceived as when it is at rest from your perspective, let's call this the rock's rest mass. Now, all we need is for you to test each other's rocks. Due to relativity's effects on space and time, your friend finds that your rock resists a change in velocity more than his. Your rock, from his perspective, has a greater mass, mrel, relativistic mass. Likewise, you could test the mass of your friend's rock. You find that his rock, from your perspective, has greater mass, mrel. You each perceive the other's rock to have more mass than your own. This is similar to what we found with the light clock in time, where each of you perceive the other's clock to be slower than your own, at the same time. And the similarities don't stop there. The factor we used to get back the rock's original mass in its own frame of reference happens to be the same as that of time dilation, gamma. Since we just found that an object's inertia increases at high speeds, it turns out that we need a modified formula for momentum. Momentum is just some vector quantity that is always conserved in a closed system. In classical mechanics, we find that if we add up each object's mass times velocity in a closed system, we get a value that never changes as time progresses, even if these objects bump into each other. So we say that this product mv is an object's momentum. And since total momentum is conserved, we call this the conservation of momentum. But a different quantity ends up being conserved if we take relativity into account. Now, it's relativistic mass times velocity which is conserved, more commonly written as gamma times rest mass times velocity. So, this quantity is what momentum is in the theory of relativity. Now what about the conservation of energy? Well, it's pretty similar except we're adding up scalar quantities as opposed to vector quantities. And there are also many different forms of energy, all with different formulas. In classical mechanics, we find that the quantity 1 half times mass times speed squared is conserved in a closed system if we assume that there are only elastic collisions. So, we see that this quantity is an object's kinetic energy. But what is this quantity in special relativity? And why did we have to multiply by this weird looking 1 half in the first place anyway? Well, this formula just happens to be equivalent to kinetic energy's true definition, the amount of work that would be needed to push an object from rest to its current speed. Just evaluate this expression under the rules of classical mechanics, and we get 1 half mv squared. So, 
What does this quantity evaluate to in special relativity? Factoring in the definition of a force and the fact that an object's inertia increases at high speeds, as we just found, we get this equation, which is starting to look awfully familiar. In special relativity, an object's kinetic energy is its relativistic mass minus the mass that it would have if it were at rest, all scaled up by the constant c squared. Let's step back and see what this equation means. If we take an object at rest, it has a mass of m0 and no kinetic energy. If we keep nudging it, increasing its speed, its kinetic energy increases, and its relativistic mass increases linearly with it, up to a factor c squared. This system gains mass every time we do work on it. And since kinetic energy is just one of many kinds of energy, we can assume that the mass of a system will increase when we simply add energy to it in any form, not caring if it ends up being kinetic energy specifically. But wait, that's just a stupid assumption, you may say. Well, this is a bit of a leap of faith, I suppose. We only derive increasing mass for kinetic energy, so we cannot immediately assume that thermal or chemical energy also inflate mass. But, consider the following. Let's start by making the safest assumption that mass only increases due to kinetic energy, and no other kind. Imagine we have two rocks stuck together at rest. Some sort of buildup has been happening between them, and it eventually gives way, flinging each rock in opposite directions. They each began with having a mass m0 when they were still fused as one large rock, but now that they are in motion, they each have more mass than before. Looking from the outside, it seems weird that the mass of the entire system as a whole could spontaneously increase. But that's not the worst part. For observers moving relative to the system, a sudden increase in mass would violate the conservation of energy and the conservation of momentum, since a spontaneous change in mass causes a spontaneous change in momentum and kinetic energy too. Despite the relation we found between mass and kinetic energy, it is still impossible for the mass of a system to spontaneously change. So how do we make sense of this? The mass did not increase when kinetic energy was gained. The mass was already inflated due to the potential energy between the rocks before they flung apart. So after all, we are forced to conclude that all energy in any form will give a system inflated mass, because any form of energy has the potential to become kinetic. The only way to really change a system's mass is to add some kind of energy to it from the outside of the system. The more energy we put into it, the greater its mass. It looks like this additional mass is a sort of measure of this added energy. Hang on. Is this what mass really is? A physical manifestation of energy? If so, what about the mass the object had before we started adding energy to it? Could this rest mass be some physical manifestation of some sort of energy too? It doesn't seem any more special than the additional mass. They are each just parts of an object's inertia. With this linear relation between mass and energy, it almost works too well. Rest mass is a physical manifestation of some sort of energy too. But wait, that's just another stupid assumption you may say. Well, yes, perhaps it is. So, the mass that any object has at rest is a physical manifestation of its built-in energy. This is known as the object's rest mass energy. And if you're curious about what this rest mass energy is, check out this video from Veritasium. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. The rest mass energy, plus the added energy, equals the total energy E equals mc squared. This is an object's relativistic mass, the inertia that the object has in our frame of reference. This is the total combined amount of energy it has, in any form. And this is the scaling factor. An object's inertia is just a sign that says, there's energy here. We're not done yet though. Nowadays, most physicists don't like to talk about relativistic mass, since it seems to create complications. For instance, it would mean that since light has energy, it has mass too, but only relativistic mass, not rest mass. But by definition, light can't be at rest in a vacuum anyway, so you see how this can get out of hand? To keep things simpler, we could just forget about relativistic mass entirely to get these equations instead, which are just as valid as the ones we had before, but now they don't rely on inventing any new properties of massive objects. Unfortunately, our short and sweet E equals mc squared seems to be gone, but it's still there. Under this interpretation, E equals mc squared is just a special case when an object is not moving. The object's rest mass times the factor c squared is the object's rest mass energy, the amount of energy it has when it's just sitting there, not moving. And this full equation isn't so bad, since it allows us to easily see a lot of other aspects of special relativity, as seen in this metaphysics video. 
man, this guy's already done everything. So to review, E equals mc squared means that mass is a physical representation of energy itself. This is motivated by the way mass and kinetic energy increase together under relativistic conservation laws. But is this all really true? Let's have a look. In particle accelerators, the total sum of the rest masses of particles is not conserved. Yes, your chemistry teacher lied to you. The conservation of mass is not always true. Instead, particle physicists conserve energy in their calculations, measured in kilo, mega, and giga electron volts, which agrees with all experiments to date. There are also ways to harness the energy manifested as the rest mass of radioactive elements. This energy can be extracted and used for electric power generation, or to make these things. Let's just hope that this knowledge can be used for the best. And just for a bit of perspective, let's calculate how much energy is contained in the rest mass of, say, a pencil. It weighs about 5 grams, which means that there are roughly 450 terajoules of energy contained in it. That's equivalent to over 100,000 tons of TNT. A pencil will certainly never explode in your hand, but its energy content might be something fun to think about the next time you hold one. So, now we know why E equals mc squared. We found out that inertial mass is just a physical indication of the presence of energy. This arose from conservation laws, a new kinematics based on the behavior of the light clock, and a touch of algebra.